Welcome back to the Justin Root Show. You guys, you are looking at a Grammy winner, an Emmy winner, a Tony winner, and a five-time Oscar nominee, and Mark Shaman. Thank you so much for coming to my show. You're welcome. Where, where am I? Um, the Justin Root Show. So thank you so much for coming. I know you're extremely busy and time pressed because you're off to a, a fancy event tonight. So I actually really can't thank you enough for swinging by on your way to it that event. It's my pleasure, Justin. Wow. All right. I should speak up. I've uh, watched your show. There's been some sound issues. You're the only guest who's watched my show. Well, and I was going to say when you said welcome back, yeah. I thought you were being rather presumptuous. <laughs> Oh, to my 10 subscribers, thank you for that. Um, well, for, okay, first of all, congratulations, because right now you're experiencing some major success with Bette Midler's It's the Girls album, yes. right? This is um, her highest... I think highest charting debut. That's incredible. Yes, yes. So, however you look at it, it's incredible. It was really nice. It was really nice. And me and her went to uh, see Stevie Wonder singing the entire record of in the key of uh, the songs in the key of life at Madison Square Garden the night that that happened so for one night we had just a really nice time thinking that crowd that they view and Stevie Wonder was singing in the original keys and it was incredible oh that's amazing well because this is your I mean 800th collaboration with her right I mean this is what seventh album is that right for uh, you two? you might know better than me at this point I don't know um yeah that sounds right okay I guess let's actually go to the beginning um you're born in New Jersey yes total east coaster yes when where how does music come into your life um I just played piano as a kid and I would just play for my aunts and uncles and people that came over and I played like a motherfucker just like showbiz prodigy just like I had all that showbiz in me even at an early age and then that was it then it was just nothing but musical theater and music forever and ever and our mom and dad encouraging and proud and pushing or yeah this isn't really going to be something you're going to make money at they were neither they were just why hmm. <laughs> tell me everything did they hurt you it. No one touched me in my no no place. So, oh. not until recently. But, um, no, once I got into musical theater, then all schoolwork went out the window. My God, you're blushing. I know, I know. Don't or is me. it just the heat in here? It's the heat in here. Anyway, all schoolwork did go out the window once I got into musical theater. My junior high school music teacher and or my friend Skip, or both, gave me Bette Midler's first two records. Amazing. And I, these records just changed my life. And me and my friend Skip, who's now named August, but at the time he was named Skip, we would dance around and mime, lip sync. And uh, see, once I stole money from my father's wallet and I cut school and I went to see Bette Midler on Broadway and her second Broadway concert was called Clams on the Half Shell. And I had this fantasy that I would run down the aisle up to the stage and say, oh, Miss Midler, I know every note of every song, of every arrangement on every record. Please let me play for you. And she would welcome me to the piano and I would play and she'd be like, hey, that's cute. I had this little daydream as I was sitting there watching. I say that because just a few years later, I was in New York with a friend from New Jersey, but I knew I wanted to go to New York and be in show business and I took the GED. And I, I, I once I hit 16, I had a, diploma. I stopped going to school. So there I was in New York and we ran into some friends from New Jersey and we went into this little bar that was there in the corner and uh, there was a piano. It was a piano bar. Marie's Crisis it's called. It's still a legendary piano bar there in the village. And I started to play and the guy was sweeping up behind the bar like out of an old movie. He went, hey kid, you're good. Wait right here. And he went and he went next door and he brought over this comedy review and one of them looked exactly like Bette Midler. My friend Tracy Berg at the time looked exactly like that member. So for around the first minute, I was like, is that Bette Midler? Why is she with these people? What's going on? But she wasn't Bette Midler. But they said, can you play together wherever we go cheesy? And I, so I never knew anyone who got that humor. It was something I would do in my room by myself. Like, well, here's how you play the song normally. And here's how you play it. Uh, you know, Stephen Eady would do it. So we became fast friends and I would stay with them on the weekends. Across the hall from one of them, I, this is why I'm telling you the story, lived one of Bette Midler's backup singers. 
She had just come off the tour. Her name was Ula Hedwig. I was like, oh my God, it's one of Bette Midler's backup singers. And the Harlettes, Bette's backup girls, want to do their own act because they always got such a reaction in Bette's show. So they needed a musical director, someone who knew all the harmonies. And I, from idolizing Bette Midler, I was full of harmony. And so I was perfect for them, and I was across the hall, and we worked for nothing. I was 16 years old. And so Bette called and said, girls, uh, I'll let you open my sh show. We'll come do the next tour, which was a small tour that was going to be at the Copa in New York, and the Roxy here. So they flew me to L.A. to rehearse, just, to rehearse her band for the Harlettes material. And then I'm sitting on a couch, not unlike this couch, in the back of the uh, re rehearsal studio, and in walks Pat Midler. She walks up to the stage, and they start rehearsing, and I'm just like, oh. and uh, then at one point she said to the band, oh, you know, let's try No Gesturing, which I, of course, knew the reggae song from the third album. And the band was all just pickup musicians who like, had no history with her. And they were like, we don't know that song, it's not in the book here. And so one of the girls went over to Bet and said, So Bet said, you back there, can you play no gesturing? And I actually got to walk to a stage and go, oh, Miss Midler, I know every note of every song, of every arrangement from every album, please let me play for you. That is almost verbatim a completely true story. I tell that story, of course, to kids and junior high schools and places where I talk because it is a literal example of a dream coming true. And what did I was she still say? Only 17. Bet said, well, uh, I could use you. And um, I ended up being her piano player to help find new material and help with the vocals. But she's so mm, frugal, shall we say, that uh, instead of putting me in a hotel, she put me in her guest room of her little rental house that she was living in. So I went from Bette Midler posters on the wall of my little room in suburban New Jersey to maybe two years later, living with Bette Midler, having breakfast with Bette Midler, and her wearing a nightgown with no bra, just me, her, and them. And, uh, and thus began a three billion year long friendship and relationship and collaboration. I'm exhausted. <laughs> Okay, so now that Bette Midler's in your life, you're starting to get a little more um, refined and successful. Um, and how long have you been out here once you met her? How long have you worked for her? So I started working with her, and then at the same time, started making a name for myself in New York City from the Girls Act, from the Harlots Act, and I got a call from Saturday Night Live. After the first initial five years, all those great people, when they left, most of the team behind the scenes left also, and they needed like a new funny Jewish person at the piano. Uh, what Paul Schaefer used to do up at the show, you know, write funny lyrics, write, put things to music, anything that had to do with performing music. It was the first year of you know, like Dana Carvey and Phil Hartman and Jan Hooks, and from that came the Sweeney Sisters. I'm imagining you developed a close relationship with with them, with both of the girls. Jane yeah, and well with everyone, anyone, everyone when you're up there. You are together all the time. You're in the trenches with these people and sometimes you're at war with them. I get the feeling, I may be naive, that it's not as competitive behind the scenes as it used to be or as nasty as it could maybe get. Because at that time, and it's the only time in my entire life and career they made me feel, for the most part, like the fag at the end of the hall. Really? Plays piano. Like, I, of course, leave it to me to be at SNL just yeah. before the real explosion of people really getting into music and how it could be in the characters. You know, now, in every monologue, it's an open, there's a song for the star in the opening monologue and so many more characters when Will Ferrell came along and Anna Gasteyer and Maya Rudolph. Music really took off on the show. But that year, that's how I felt, whether right or wrong. And it's the only time, what a blessing, that I ever felt that way. Um, so, but then I started going with Billy and Mark when Marty Short and Chris Guest and Billy did the show. Mm -hmm. Maybe I've got that backwards. Maybe they were before. I don't remember. Do you? Who are you? <laughs> um, anyway, I would tour with Billy Crystal. 
I played piano for Billy Crystal. In his comedy act, I would underscore his monologues and banter a little bit with him. Which reminds me of one of my classic Jewish mother stories is once during that time, I called my mother as I always do uh, once a week on Sunday and she said, so what did you do this week? I said, well, on Friday I rehearsed with Bette all day and then I worked with Billy Crystal that night. And she said, so maybe through them you'll meet someone important. Oh. <laughs> That's amazing. Mm-hmm. So, so then one day Bette called and said, they want me to yodel in front of a steel band in this movie I'm making, Big Business. Really common. Yeah. Turns out. So I helped her figure that out. And then I went with her to the filming, I think, on the Monday. So the producer and director were very nice and seemed just so friendly and youngish. They were, you know, at that time I thought, well, the director is going to be some, you know, Max! You know, bald and with a writing crop. And, um, but they seemed like young guys, not I mean, older than me, but contemporaries nonetheless. And I asked them, how does someone audition for a movie? And although they laughed at me, at the time, Something about me stuck in their heads because months later they called on the phone with the head of music at Disney, his name is Chris Montan, and they said, We're going to send you some film and let you, like you said, audition. And that's how I, I auditioned. I did like three pieces of music, I think. And I just knew, okay, when Lily Tomlin's finger touches the doorknob, I know I have to be at the, the measure I need to be at for this other thing to fall in the right place. And I just would watch it and watch it over until I knew all these little. Guideposts, signposts, what would be the word? And then I went in with a bass player and a drummer, and these poor guys had to follow me as I was just watching and playing, and I sent it in, and lo and behold, they called and said, you got the job. But I was still working with Bet on Beaches also at that time, when a little movie was being developed called Beaches, and I had been chosen to help Bet figure out what song she would sing. And at the same time-ish, Billy Crystal, I did an HBO special for Billy Crystal. Mm-hmm. Rob Reiner heard it and they kind of heard the, me. Anyway, Billy Crystal basically got me the job of When Harry Met Sally. Rob, that's it. Billy Crystal asked Rob, what kind of music you're going to use on When Harry Met Sally, the movie they were making? And he said, I need some guy who knows standards, who knows like every song and can figure out how to. He said, I got the guy. Both were huge hits and the huge. soundtracks, soundtracks were huge. And well, when beneath know, my wings. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and I'm the guy who played. Who You're, said, "I got the song for you." Yeah. Well, not only you know, I don't always talk like that. Yeah. But, but it was Beach is the first thing you were in, to the first film you were in, too, right? Was it as a? I guess so. Yeah, and that you opened the movie. Yes. Yeah, so, oh, I had all that hair at the Hollywood Bowl. Give me some. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, at the Hollywood Bowl. All right, I'm gonna make you guys something. What do you think? My favorite film is that you've been involved with. Involved. Adam's Family? Adam's Family Value. I love them both, but no. Did you mention it earlier? No, I haven't said it yet. In and Out? No, great film though. I don't know. Broadcast News. Broadcast News. That was, you know, when you said that's the first time you were on screen about beaches, I knew something in my head was going, no, there was something else. It's such an incredible, and it's the, I think all of them in it, it's their best work. It's an unbelievable movie because we are the only thing in that whole movie that isn't about the three main characters on screen talking. There isn't a shot of a house at sunset. Yes. There isn't a shot of the plane landing. There's nothing but the three people talking mm-hmm. and then this bizarre scene. I mean, when can I... As far as music in the films you've done, I mean, it's, I have other favorites too on that one. Um, I mean, who doesn't love Sister Act? Like one of the best movies of all time. Which they had written for Bette Midler. Mm-hmm. But she didn't want to do it. I don't, I don't want to be in a, in a whipple. Wimple. My fans won't want to see me in a wimple. So she said no to this movie, which was written for her. So perfect for her. So Whoopi Goldberg did it, but she was, Whoopi Goldberg was giving him a lot of crap about her deal and stuff. And was a real big star, a movie star, and was really, you know. Playing it up. Yeah. And so they actually called me in one day. And there's Jeffrey Katzenberg going, Mark. We need you to see if you can help get that back in the movie. What do you think? I was like, oh, I don't know. Meanwhile, I started working with Whoopi, and I was like, I don't know. I think she's going to be okay. How about the last Tonight Show ever? The last Tonight Show, Johnny Carson chooses Bette Midler to sing, and every house in America was watching that. Not a dry eye in those houses. 
doing that last Johnny Carson was truly the most and nothing will ever top that. The open night of hairspray, I'd say maybe tops it. But uh, uh, Beck called and said they want me to sing on the last night show. Got any ideas? I got it. One for my baby, one for the road. It's a song you sing to a guy who's been a guy you've been talking to for years, and now we all know it's time to close up shop. So thanks for listening. It's perfect. She's like, well, I can't sing that song. Oh, I can't hit those notes. Uh, I'll be. Like, Brett, don't even start the, the back and forth thing. This is, I can see it, I can hear it, just let's rehearse. That's it. We're not even thinking about any other song. And then began something I can only remember as a full on dream, like drug induced mushrooms couldn't create the feeling that was going on in that studio at that moment where the whole staff around TVs, everyone crying already, basically because it was what it was, and then to have this responsibility to them and to America, if, if everyone was watching week after week and every big star was coming out to say goodbye and it was like this tidal wave and then here we were in this last night and then I had all these little ideas of other little things I was going to play in between the chords, but it was so tender and uh, I was so, we all were so just, uh, that I can barely get the chords out when I hear what I played now, it worked. But it wasn't what I kind of meant, but I, I was too scared to even try. I was just play the chord, listen to her, breathe with her, and I play the right stuff, be in the moment. Yeah. And, and I can watch it now, and then that brilliant camera, that shot that they came up with for that last moment of looking over her shoulder at Johnny and listening. And then ending it with the Tonight Show theme, like any gay Jewish musical director would. You know, it was just perfect. Um, where are your awards? Scattered about. They're on pianos. They're not. I don't like. They're not hidden. Like Good. people say. Oh, I don't know where they are. They're on the piano with like a spotlight down on. Not a spotlight, and uh, uh, next to a lot of pictures and other stuff. There they are. I mean, you know me well enough to know that I would have loved to have seen them. You don't travel with them. No. Why? Well, the Emmy is very dangerous. It's got those. Yeah. You could. Re I'm shocked that there hasn't been a murder. Do they let you take them on planes? Because I always wonder when people... The Emmy Award, I can imagine, like, it's really dangerous. Yeah, I don't think, I think, I always wonder when people win them out here and then have to fly back to New York. You'll never know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm not being mean to Justin. It's this thing that we do. Uh, let me ask you, do you have a preference? I'm imagining it's comedy, but uh, for scoring a comedy versus a drama. Because, I mean, Misery, one of Rob Reiner's classic and you know earlier films is the complete opposite of what I think of when I think of you and scoring um no I wish I got to do more things that weren't just like the romantic comedies and that's when I started getting well that's when I started taking antidepressants when I was just getting one movie after another that it was the same and I didn't I found one day I didn't want to go to the piano and then thank god the South Park movie came along and I was like it was like salvation, not, you know, just, I got to do everything I ever wanted on that. And then that led to people saying, he's the guy you should get for Hairspray, when they were putting together the team to write Hairspray, so. Yeah, let's talk about Hairspray, actually. I mean, hugely successful. Yeah, Scott and I were the biggest John Waters fans on earth, still are, and so when that call came, it was like, well, this is perfect. We just, we, we think like John Waters, so it was the perfect gig and, you know, the songs just poured out of us. And he was in support of it, right? And yeah, he it. was just kind of like the fairy godmother of it, you know, he, we, he was invited to the, the readings and he came to the first reading and his, obviously his, uh, it was important what, what he felt and he fell in love and when we did Timeless to Me for him. Because also it became very, to say the least, a bittersweet thing for him. Although his biggest success, he really only it only made him think of Divine dying. She died the weekend, like after the movie opened. Oh, wow. It was like this bizarre thing of like, oh my God, we have a big opening weekend, and my best friend Star died. So, Hairspray the musical helped give him a new life and perspective on it. What was Tony Knight like? It was good. It was pretty, it was, I mean, it was pretty memorable and spectacular. I mean, you know. Yeah, I didn't thank my parents. And it was almost like literally the only time on earth my father was really angry at me in a real way. 
and when I came to find them in the audience afterwards. Because other things, other emotions, you know, you, you can plan it a million years and suddenly you're up there and you're with your partner and you both have to speak and they're about to play the music and a million thoughts are going, you're like in this white blinding room of your mind. And I somehow didn't thank my parents and my father was really upset. So actually, that's what I think of when you say that night because I'm Jewish and that's what I immediately go to. Wow. Did you think you were going to win? Yes. You did. That's amazing. I love that you said that. Well, I mean, it was really good, and we also were in a good year to be up for other the other musicals. Nothing came to the level of what Hairspray had become. Mm -hmm. But then our friends, Matthew and Sarah Jessica, got to... Sarah Jessica who? Uh, Smith. Smith. Um, they asked to give our award, and we were like, oh, this would be horrible if they have to open that envelope, and it's not us. So that was, that was great, that our friends, because not to be name droppy or shoe droppy but uh this is the most name droppy show ever yeah so please carry on well looks like you're ready to go to your event so that means it's time for either or all right so mark shaman hairspray or gel well i know how you feel about it uh hairspray the show winter olympics summer olympics where are the gymnastics i have no idea oh, well. uh summer olympics summer yeah. olympics all right happy feet or happy meal Happy feet or happy meal? One gives me the other. I don't know. I had a happy meal today, didn't I? Um, you mean Steve Martin or McDonald's? Is that what you mean? I don't know. Oscar after party or Tony after party? Well, Tony after party if you've won. Oreos or Chips Ahoy? That, that's nothing, you know, I can't make that decision. New Year's Eve or Christmas? Christmas. Helen Hunt or Helen Keller? I knew you were going to say that. Well, I like them both. Steve Martin Short or Carol Channing Tatum? I see what you've done. Well, that's, I can't make these decisions. Buffalo wings or potato skins? In England, they call them uh, jack potatoes. Where they take a mashed potato and they put other stuff in it. Sure. Scoring films or scoring chicks? Films. Crosby, Stills, or Nash? Bing Crosby? <laughs> American Idol or The Voice? I like your hit parade from Nike. Someone arriving an hour early, someone arriving an hour late. Early. Snake or tarantula? Snake. Helicopter or hot air balloon? Helicopter. Broadway Angela Lansbury or Murder, She Wrote Angela Lansbury? Broadway. Playbill? I realize for some of your age it's probably you murder two No. Playbill or Playgirl? What's the difference? Bagel or croissant? <laughs> Bagel. Ceiling fan or crazed fan? Ceiling fan in this room. Soon. Quickly, please. Spaghetti or lasagna? Lasagna. Chinese food or pizza? This is like Sophie's Choice. Gilda Radner or John Belushi? Gilda Radner. Olive Garden or a Rose Garden? Ro Rose Garden. Bette Midler or Barbra Streisand? <laughs> Why Barbra Streisand stories? We didn't talk about those. They're not, you know, I didn't... Well, Redhead Bette Midler or blonde Bette Midler? Redhead. I wish you would just, I, I, you know, every time she comes out with another blonde do I go, yeah, okay, but where's Redhead? I agree. I totally agree. Um, beaches or First Wife Club? Oh, well, Beaches does it have a lot of songs in it. So. Yeah, fair enough. That was easy, right? Um. Go ahead. Oh, uh, well, that was easy enough. Oh my God, that is fantastic. Those are amazing. <gasps> so I was, someone took, a group of people took me uh, shopping on a break with Bette Midler rehearsals. They're purple, there's like a purple reflection. And best stage manager is a shoe girl. And she said, you were buying these shoes. Uh, and they literally cost more than every single thing I else I, I bought that day combined. Oh my God. And they're so un-me. What are I they? I mean, this is not me. Corte? I don't know anything about it except 
Corte, we love cost. Corte, and if Corte ever wants to send anything to the Justin Root show, would be more than willing to wear a size 12 for them. That's what I have. The guy at Saks said, uh, oh my they God, come with a, a, a free shoe stretcher. I said, how nice, what's his name? But, uh, um, well, I can't thank you enough for coming. I know it's, yeah. you'd never guess that it was. We well, gotta come back. I didn't, barely scratch the surface. Barely scratch the surface. Well, what's and next? how are you, Justin? <laughs> what's next for Tell you? me what's up with you. This. Yeah, what's 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 next with you? Well, um, I actually feel that I um, really could mm. use. I know it's crunchy. I wouldn't oh touch it. Oh my god! I know. It doesn't well, look that way. I know. It's usually not, but it is for this. So now I've just done that. Um, what's next for you? I think I broke my finger. I know. Um, Scott and I are about to write a plethora of musicals. Really? Yes. Okay. Well, we got to get you that Oscar first because you're almost an EGOT winner. It's like just you're a get. I know. You're a get. Got to get that got. Vote. I'm a got. No, you haven't won the Oscar. Oh, oh, yeah, you're right. You know, you fix that yeah. post. No, I'm going to let you look like that. All right? You're a get. Yeah. Got to get that O. No, I'm an egged. You're an, you won an Emmy. Well, if you say EGOT, you take out the O. Oh, so it's an egged. egged. An egged. I'm a little OCD. As a matter of fact, I'm so OCD that I call it CDO, so that it's an alphabetical order. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'll be here all week. I won't be. We gotta go. But thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure you subscribe. Um, he's gonna continue. He might be the next host. I don't know. You might see him with somebody else. Um, maybe Bette Midler. Maybe Billy Crystal. I mean, you have a list of friends that if you want to send them this way, I would not turn them down. Just I'm, I would like to see Mariah Carey on your couch. I would love to have Mariah Carey on yeah, this I'm couch. I'm gonna put in a call. So, you guys heard that here. Mariah Carey will be on next. Subscribe and stay tuned and we will see you later. Thank you so much. Call her now. Now. Call her now. Call her now. <laughs> no, serious, call her. Get it get your phone. Get his phone. Get his phone. I want her on the show now.